Uh, hello there. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, could you, could you come to order, please? Uh, we're about to start. Thank you very much. My name is Ahmed Rashid, and I've been a regular visitor here and uh, covered the former Soviet Union both as a journalist and as a, ri as a writer. Um, and in the light of that, I just wanted to remind the audience that today is the 12th anniversary of the massacre at Andijan in the Ferghana Valley, uh, when some 800 to 1,500, we will never know how many people were shot dead uh, by the Uzbek security forces while they were holding a peaceful demonstration. Well, um, let me just say, this is perhaps uh, going to be one of the most, uh, um, I hope, one of the most heated uh, discussions that we're going to have. Um, uh, I don't think we've ever had a, an election, certainly not in, in our lifetimes, the election of a US president who has, been, um, who has become so controversial so quickly. Um, there are so many questions and doubts about uh, within the allies, within, uh, around the world, about what President Trump is all about and what his foreign policy is going to be. I I is his foreign policy a real distortion of American, um, traditional American foreign policy? Or is it actually just the same re uh, Republican kind of policy except pursued in this very um, eccentric way by a, a, a very eccentric president um, and, and not pursued through the normal means of uh, the State Department, etc. What about the State Department? Uh, are, we, are we seeing the demise of the State Department, an entire structure of U.S. government going down the tubes? Um, who, who, who will, um, uh, are we going to see increasing powers being given to the White House, the National Security Council taking decisions? But then who is going to actually officiate over long-term diplomatic efforts that will be needed, for example, to resolve North Korea or resolve Syria or any of these other things. It could take months of diplomacy, teams of diplomats, and yet nobody is still in place to, to, to actually do that. Um, the need for diplomacy cannot be overemphasized, and, and we are still not, um, uh, we haven't seen the Trump administration <coughs> actually excel uh, in that. Um, Finally, I think a very valid point uh, has been raised about um, what does America stand for? Um, what about the, the values of, of, the, uh, of America? The defense of human rights, press freedom, uh, protection of minorities, etc., which um, past U.S. presidents have not always done, but they have been obliged <coughs> to do because of uh, domestic pressure inside the U.S. And finally, I'd like, I'd like every, all of us to look to the future. And, and perhaps try and ruminate a bit as to how, um, uh, how this, this administration is going to pan out <coughs> as far as foreign policy is concerned. Um, and I'd like to say here, finally, that um, we will be focusing on foreign policy. I don't particularly uh, uh, want questions and, and, and debates on Mr. Trump's internal domestic problems, uh, mm -hmm. whatever um, he may have. So, we have a, a, a very um, distinguished cast of characters <laughs> sitting on the stage. Um, beginning with uh, um, uh, Steve Began, uh, who is, uh, for two decades, has been a foreign policy advisor to the President of the US and Congress, and is very well versed in, um, in, in the ways of the US government. Uh, Peter Brooks, who's now the Senior Fellow for National Security Affairs at the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's been in, at DOD, he's been Deputy <coughs> Assistant Secretary, he's served in, in other capacities in the U.S. government. Um, <coughs> Sarah Kenzizor, um, who's a journalist and researcher, she's a columnist for the Globe and Mail, and perhaps she's most uh, best well known for her book, uh, her, her, her book that came out in two, 2015, The View from Flyover Country which of course was, is, is became extremely relevant in, in this uh, last election. And finally, James Kerchik, uh, who's a journalist and uh, foreign correspondent, and his book, I'm sure will um, uh, create a lot of controversy, came out two months ago, published by Yale University Press, and is called The End of Europe, Dictators, Demagogues, and the Coming Dark Age. So, um, 
We have, <laughs> now I'm going to give each one of you um, five to seven minutes to state your position on the discussion that we want to have, and then uh, we'll take it on from there. So can I start with you? Thank you, Ahmed. <laughs> Madam President, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a, certainly a great pleasure to be with you all at the Leonard Mary Conference. I'm going to try in, uh, in my presentation uh, to begin with to give a, a bit of a framework on how we might try to understand the evolving foreign policy, national security policy of the Trump administration and perhaps um, uh, vainly attempt to uh, leave you with some kernels of optimism as well, um, which I think are there to be found um, and we don't have to look all that closely to see them. Uh, let me start with a couple of caveats. Uh, I, um, I have been a, a Republican, part of the Republican foreign policy establishment in my entire adult life. I've worked on every presidential campaign uh, as a foreign policy advisor to the, the pres Republican candidate since 1996. I did not work in this campaign after the primaries. And uh, so I hear, I'm here speaking for myself. Um, I don't speak for the administration, um, uh, but, I, but I'm willing to speak about the administration's policies and I do occasionally speak to the administration, admittedly. Um, uh, my first caveat is that I've been wrong at every single turn during the course <laughs> of this presidential campaign. So take that into consideration as you listen to my remarks. And the other caveat is I'm taking a snapshot of where this administration, where American foreign policy is today. Um, not, not where it was six months ago and not where it might be six months from now. I think that's a discussion we can have. But for now, I'm going to anchor it in the here and now. Um, I actually don't agree with uh, the premise um, that was in the program about how the Trump administration's foreign policy can be characterized as, as um, zero-sum game uh, or even as transactional. And let me explain to you how uh, many of us and all of us are trying to figure out our new president and the policies. Uh, w uh, we are in the... In the uh, non-governmental sector, private sector, um, allies are, and, and adversaries are. Um, and, and some allies are trying to decide whether they're adversaries or allies too in the process. But um, uh, what, we've, what we've kind of figured out is first of all, uh, with, uh, with the president, with his administration, you have to focus on what they do, not what they say. And there are a lot of word clouds out there. There are a lot of things that, um, uh, that uh, do distract and do inflame. It's very difficult to compartmentalize, and I, I would acknowledge words have an impact. But um, if you measure the administration by the sum of its foreign policies rather than the sum of its foreign policy statements, I think you have two very different ledgers. Uh, second is um, that all of us, and here I speak on behalf of the interests I represent back home as well, to be careful not to take the bait. A lot of times uh, the words are a provocation. The words are intended <coughs> to to move the other side into a certain position. Um, we've seen cases of this uh, um, uh, uh, not uh, too long ago in this city, the president of the European Union was quoted as identifying the United States as one of the top threats facing the European Union. I thought it was a huge mistake uh, to use that rhetoric and, and it just fits the <coughs> definition of taking the bait in my view and, and creating an opportunity for more friction. Um, so first, uh, focus on what they say, what they do, not what they say. Second, uh, don't take the bait. And the third is that um, this president is win-win. He is not zero-sum game. And I think we've seen that demonstrably in a number of cases, certainly in the course of the uh, economic debates inside the United States, but going into foreign policy. President Trump campaigned on some pretty tough policy positions, positions like immediately sanctioning China over its currency manipulation, policies like advocating um, the JASTA Act, the Justice for the Victims of Terrorism related to 9-11. And President Trump's first foreign visit next week is to Saudi Arabia, the country that was the target of that legislation. Um, the president uh, is definitely looking for win-wins. And I, and I think he's gonna get them in many cases as well. So that's how, that's how uh, I would characterize the administration. Not zero-sum game, but win-win. And let me just say a couple, a couple of last words. One is, the president has assembled a tremendous foreign policy team around him. The combination of Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, and General McMaster as the National Security Advisor are an incredibly talented group of people, and they've already demonstrated their mettle, in my view, in leading the United States for the first time in nine years to a position of conviction and 
that, that reflects our values in Syria. And I think that is a direct product of the quality, the advice, the experience, and the breadth of the national security cabinet around the president. The team is filling in beneath them slowly, too slowly, admittedly, but it's filling in. And I think there's reasons to believe that we will get many more talented people uh, working underneath the, that cabinet team. The second is, and here I want to I want to end by pointing to the policies themselves. The president's policies on Europe have actually been quite constructive. I've heard, had any number of conversations with people in this room this weekend who have more access to the White House than they've had in years, that feel that they have a direct discussion and, and conversation with the administration on their policies, and I think that's demonstrable in, in, uh, in, in many ways in the visits as well that have come to Europe so early in this administration. Um, we have a president who has uh, started on a, on a pretty positive and constructive basis with China, which is probably the most important uh, relationship the United States has in the world today. Uh, the president has found uh, a bit more evenness on Russia, although it's vacillated uh, uh, back and forth a bit. And in the Middle East, um, as I said, the president's making his first trip overseas to Saudi Arabia. Um, he's engaged in a friendly dialogue with both Saudi Arabia and the state of Israel. And the president has committed himself to trying to pursue a, a reasonable settlement for peace in the Middle East as well. So the president is, is engaging on policies in a manner that reflects broadly the traditions of American foreign policy over the entire post-Cold War period. Let me just conclude with three quick caveats. One is the team is very important to this foreign policy, and there's no guarantees that this team is around six months or nine months from now. The, the durability and sustainability of this team is very important, I think, to the quality of the policies that we're gonna get. Second is that um, um, while we're not gonna go into the president's domestic woes, without a doubt the president's domestic standing um, is, is, is the foundation upon which he projects influence into the world, so it, it does have a consequence. And the third, um, the system is, this uh, structure in the foreign policy establishment in, inside this administration is still under development. It could be tested by crisis. And uh, heaven forbid we have a crisis of any significant nature, but we know several places where that could happen. And it's a very different kettle of fish when you're trying to operate in, in a crisis situation versus building your foreign policy team. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here uh, to speak about, uh, speak about this issue because when I look, first looked at the question, uh, when it was sent to me, I was a little, a little bothered by it. it. It seemed a little stark. It seemed a little outdated. Uh, and I, I think it's important for people to know, maybe it had been written during the campaign, uh, but I think it's important to, for people to know, uh, if you're not familiar with the American saying, is that where you uh, stand is where you sit. Um, and what that means is if you're in a heated political campaign, things may be said uh, that may be different when you actually are elected and come into office. Um, saying it as, as candidate Trump is one thing, saying it as President Trump is, is, is another thing. And I don't see, I'm quite frankly, and somebody, Steve and I were on the Hill together years ago and in the Bush administration, not been the, as part of the Republican establishment as long as Steve has, but. Um, I feel very comfortable with what we're seeing out of the White House on, on foreign policy. I don't see it as zero sum. Uh, sure, transactional, but a lot of foreign policy is. Maybe all foreign policy is. A lot of human, a lot of human life is transactional. Um, I think that the, I'm very comfortable with his, his uh, foreign policy so far. Um, I find it to be quite mainstream. Um, and, but I, I think there are some things that are different from the previous administration. Um, he, um, and perhaps being a little more hard knuckled on some things, which I think are, are a good thing. Um, I think he is serious about, uh, about burden sharing, and I support that. I think it's critically important. Um, the United States has allies both in Europe and Asia. I think it's critically important that uh, people pull their weight, that countries pull their weight, especially considering the unprecedented number of threats that we, that we, face, that we face today uh, to our values, uh, to our systems. And um, I just wanted to point out some of the things. I mean, if you, if you don't think about the different issues that are out there, the different challenges the White House in just a little over 100 days, I mean, this is a new administration. Uh, it's reasonable for a new administration to look at the policies and practices and procedures uh, of a previous administration, bring in personnel that can support it. But I'm not as worried about personnel as perhaps some people are. I mean, there are a lot of systems out there. Speaking to a Finnish friend yesterday, talking about his system, they have very few political appointees. 
And the same thing here. I mean, the United States has a dedicated group of individuals in our national security and foreign policy establishment that are doing their jobs day to day. And they will take orders if there is a change in, change in direction. So I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I was a political appointee. Steve was. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable, and I think it is important to eventually have your team in there. But I remember being held up in my position at the Pentagon because we had uh, one of the senators, uh, one of the senators changed party, and it was hard getting people through confirmation process. So I'm not as worried. I'm not as worried about that. But I mean, if you think about all the issues out there, I mean, terrorism. The approach hasn't changed really. In fact, in some ways, it's intensified against ISIS and Al Qaeda by the by the Trump administration. The president has recommitted himself uh, to NATO. He spoke to the French president today. I understand from news reports uh, back in the states. He's coming to Brussels. Has been mentioned many times. He's serious about Iran and the threat that Iran presents to American interests and those of friends and partners in the Middle East and, and, and Europe, and has implemented sanctions against their missile and missile program. The United States was the only country who responded to the use of chemical weapons, again, by the Bashar al-Assad regime with a missile strike. It was the only country. And that was a, a, a vast difference from the previous administration um, in terms of that. North Korea. Uh, the president has moved beyond the, the policy of strategic patience, which uh, clearly North Korea is a much greater threat to Asia and the United States than it is than it is to Europe. But it is potentially a global problem, especially their potential cooperation with the Iranians on ballistic missile and nuclear on, and nuclear and nuclear issues. He's 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 reached out to the Japanese, an important ally in the United States. Met met early on with Prime Minister with Prime Minister Abe. In South Korea, he deployed THAAD, which was actually something that was considered under the Obama administration. This is the missile defense system for dealing with uh, um, in terminal phase, uh, terminal phase missiles. Afghanistan, though the policy has not been approved yet, and there's a lot of talk about it in Washington, and I'm sure it will come up at the mini summit in, in Brussels, uh, the president is talking about increasing our uh, commitment, commitment there after almost 16, after almost 16 years. China, people were very upset about President Trump, some people were very upset about President Trump taking a phone call from uh, the Taiwanese president. Uh, the president since then has engaged China very deeply on issues of trade and of North Korea and has, has uh, recommitted the United States to the one, the one China policy. Um, Russia, the, the, uh, the foreign minister of the Ukraine was in the Oval Office yesterday and the president said he's not going to back off on sanctions, if I got the reporting right on Ukraine until Russia does, does what it should do in, uh, in, eastern, in eastern Ukraine. So I mean, these are just, these are just some examples um, out there. And there maybe there's some others that I missed or, or perhaps it may run against the grain and what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here. But I feel that the, the Trump administration's foreign policy so far has been, uh, has been quite mainstream uh, in, terms of, in terms of views and one that myself as a conservative and a Republican are very, uh, very comfortable with. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Sarah. OK. Well, first, thank you for having me. It's uh, very exciting to be here. So we're going to talk about the limits of transactional foreign policy. Uh, I have a little bit of a different perspective than the other panelists. Uh, in my mind, the main transaction of the Trump presidency goes from American taxpayers into the Trump family pockets. Trump is, at heart, a kleptocrat. There are others in the administration uh, that have a variety of different aims, and I'll get into that later. But for him, it's about what it's always been about throughout his 40-year career, which is money, power, and fame. Trump treats the presidency like he's treated all of his corrupt businesses, many of which have gone bankrupt. He bullies, threatens, and behaves as if he's above the law, using legal loopholes in order to break the law, as we saw recently last week in the firing of James Comey. He has no basic geopolitical understanding of almost anything. This is why he mistook NATO to be something akin to, say, a mafia protection racket. That is his frame of mind. That is how he interprets world affairs. Trump is not only a kleptocrat. He is building a dynastic kleptocracy in the United States by abusing executive power in order to benefit himself and his immediate Sarah, can family we, members. Can, can we stick to foreign policy, please? I'm getting um, this is part uh, of foreign policy. I mean, we don't want to know about what he's doing. Oh, no, doing. no. This is foreign policy related. Right. Trust me. By installing, Ivanka, <laughs> by installing Ivanka and Jared in the White House, he's been able to abuse executive power through them by making business deals with foreign powers such as China, 
uh, that allow them to pursue their own objectives. For example, he shifted China's uh, foreign policy so that Ivanka could sell her handbag and jewelry lines there. The same is being done with uh, Jared's family, and who are basically trying to sell visas uh, to the United States through China. Um, both of these have been uh, roundly condemned. This is very similar to the kind of policies you see in other dynastic, autocratic regimes, such as Uzbekistan, for example, which uh, Ahmed mentioned earlier, which also was run by a, a kleptocrat who had a you know, vengeance for various ethnic minorities and had a fashion designer daughter who you know, dominated policy to a certain extent until things went a bit awry. So this is really not an unfamiliar pattern if you studied autocracies around the world. What it is unfamiliar um, is for people of the United States who I think are still trying to process what exactly uh, we're dealing with. Besides his family members, the people who influence Trump's foreign policy, uh, I basically divide into two camps, the same ones that Trump does, uh, haters and losers. And so in the haters camp, you will find people like Steve Bannon, Seb Gorka, um, Jeff Sessions, people who are ideological extremists. And so Trump being fairly malleable with no strong geopolitical um, strategy of his own is able to be shaped by them. On the other side, and this is more domestic, so I'll be brief, are people like Ben Carson or Betsy DeVos, who seem to have been appointed in order to destroy the cabinets uh, that they are supposed to leave. Then we also have people who were linked in various ways to Vladimir Putin, such as uh, Secretary of State Tillerson, a recipient of the Order of Friendship Medal, and the uh, fired former agent Michael Flynn. Uh, within this camp, thankfully, there are a few people who are competent, who are informed, and who have an actual track record of, uh, foreign, intelligence, of foreign prowess that could be useful um, in a more functional administration. And these people are basically Mattis uh, and McMasters. However, the danger is that there is no real indication that Trump will heed these folks as he doesn't really value competency. He values, above all, applause. You saw this danger uh, when Trump, feel, having low approval ratings, struck Syria, bombed Afghanistan, and flirted with nuclear war with North Korea as the media responded by labeling him once again presidential. When this happens, it lasts about 12 hours until something else goes awry and all comes crashing down. Um, this is a very dangerous uh, way to behave. There is no thought behind this. There's no long-term strategy to these various military uh, approaches. And in terms of North Korea, there's been no consistent rhetoric. And that's one of the things that I'm most worried about, is that people within this administration do not seem to be talking to each other on foreign policy, do not seem to be coming up with a consistent strategy. And that can lead to a very dangerous situation, because this is a double-sided issue. You know, we one panelist mentioned before, you can look at what he does instead of what he says. Other countries are going to be looking at both. And so you can't have this kind of dangerous uh, incoherence. And so I think we need to be uh, realistic and upfront about what this administration has offered. Uh, because, you know, I think we got into this position <clears throat> by viewing the world through typical American <clears throat> optimism, through rose-colored glasses. That's why very few people uh, predict, did not, very few people predicted his win. I did predict his win. But uh, I guess I'll close by saying, you can't see a mushroom cloud through those rose-colored glasses. So, thank you. James. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with my other panelists that we are seeing a, a pretty big gap in what Donald Trump said on the campaign trail in the way he's behaving. But we're also seeing a gap in what he says as president in what he's doing. Uh, for instance, if you look at the recent deployment of the THAAD system to South Korea, he apparently called up the South Korean prime minister and demanded that they pay up a billion uh, dollars. And then what happened was it was interesting is that uh, H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor, quietly called his counterpart in South Korea and basically said, you know, ignore the leader of the free world. He doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And apparently Trump found out about this, and now he's very angry at McMaster, who, by the way, happens to be probably the most qualified person in his cabinet. And I, and, I, and I don't think it's coincidental that the person Trump is angriest with is one of the most competent people that works for him. So we now have this problem where we have a president of the United States whose word people can't trust and, who, and, who the, and, who, and uh, whose, whose credibility is seriously questioned. And this has consequences. I mean, if you think of something like Article 5 of, of the NATO charter, which calls for the defense of allies. 
uh, Donald Trump for all his newfound love of NATO, and apparently NATO is no longer obsolete, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that, um, he has yet to endorse Article 5 explicitly. And this is something that I think he needs to do soon. Um, and I would also say that this, this behavior is having an effect on the domestic politics of our allies. I don't, I mean, I'm not an expert on South Korea, but I'm sure the way he had, be, he had been behaving over the past couple of weeks played some role in that election where we now have a, a more anti-American, left of center, you could say, uh, leader of that country. Um, the Iran deal, which uh, Peter mentioned, I'm not aware of Donald Trump doing anything to repeal the Iran deal, which is what he declared repeatedly during the campaign. It was the worst deal ever negotiated. He was going to scrap it. Uh, instead, it's going along swimmingly. So I'm not, again, I don't know what to trust about what the president says. Most worrisome for me has been the effect of all this rhetoric uh, regarding Russia on the Republican Party. Uh, positive views of Vladimir Putin have tripled among Republicans over the past year and a half. A poll came out two weeks ago showing that 56% of Republicans now consider Russia to be an ally of the United States. This is the party of Ronald Reagan. Um, and I think what we've seen is that several years ago, there, uh, we saw this as a fringe development. Uh, Russia was trying to cultivate the right wing in America, as they've been doing in Europe. And it was mostly limited to you know, fringe movements, the kind of anti-gay marriage, bitter enders. Um, uh, but now it just came to light that two years ago there was an NRA delegation. The National Rifle Association went to Moscow. And you are seeing uh, on the editorial pages of the Washington Times, an influential conservative newspaper is now defending Russia left and right. Um, regarding what Steve said about a win-win foreign policy, I, I agree that there are obviously many things that are win-win. Uh, and I'm glad that President Trump in some senses has come around to seeing uh, that allies can also get things out of deals that are good as well. Um, but there are some global issues that are not win-win. And I think Syria is one of them. And the president still seems to labor under the delusion that both the United States and Russia can cooperate in Syria and both get an end game that they agree on. And by the way, this is a delusion that the last administration labored under as well. Um, What, bo what has bothered me also uh, is, in terms of Europe, is uh, the relationship with Germany, which is the most important relationship that the United States has in Europe. The meeting with Chancellor Merkel was repulsive. As an American, I was ashamed of the behavior. Um, during the campaign, I think Donald Trump attacked Chancellor Merkel by name more than any other world figure. This is a woman who's probably one of the most pro-American leaders in Europe. Um, meanwhile, he had nothing but positive things to say about Vladimir Putin. Um, to get back to the broader Russia question, if you want to understand why the Russians wanted Donald Trump to win, I don't think you need any of these sort of conspiracy theories that a lot of people on the left in the United States are hunting for. I don't think we need revelations about secret bank accounts or collusion, although that might absolutely come out, and I support in, in, in independent investigation to find out. If you want to understand why the Russians wanted Trump to win, just look at what has been happening in the United States this week. Look at the chaos, look at the, look at the, the craziness, look at the just utter um, uh, uh, insanity of what is going on with the FBI. Uh, Jeb Bush called Donald Trump during the campaign the chaos candidate. And I think that was very accurate and he's becoming the chaos president in the United States. And we are so distracted by what he's doing and the daily drama of Trump and his Twitter account and his attacks on fellow members of the government and his fellow citizens that America is not in a position to lead the world anymore. Um, and so that, that's what bothers me. And I don't see that changing. Because Donald Trump, he's 70 years old. I'm sorry to the older people in the room. You don't change when you're 70 years old. <laughs> this is what he's going to be. And this is what we're stuck with for the next three and a half years. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any supporters, Steve. Well, um, let me ask a few questions before I throw it open to the House. I mean, I think this is a very important point, especially for the audience here, that what, um, you know, he, he, as you said, we should uh, see what he does and not what he says. But the, the point is that the world, the, the, the message to the world is what he says. The world does not see necessarily everything that he does. 
Um, or if they do see it, they see it very late in the day. Initially, it's the statements, the tweets, uh, et cetera. Um, how do we get over this hurdle where, you know, at least there should be some matching uh, between saying and doing? So uh, if I could say it a little bit more specifically, I think at the end of the day that the test of the success of this administration's policies is going to be in what they do and not in what they say. And um, but the, how, how, how the, do you explain the, that to other countries right. in Europe? So right. I, you know, I think there, I think there has to, I, I think uh, the president's team has got a lot of work to do in this area. And what I would counsel, and I think, uh, I think independently, uh, they've, they've launched on this, is I, I would counsel a, a, a little bit more urgency around the effort of developing a strategic framework for the administration's policies, um, tying these disparate. Uh, ideas together, you know, how does Syria fit into the context of China, how, how does China fit into the context of North Korea and so on. I do think the administration would be well served by putting together a more strategic framework that can do two things. One is it can explain its policies and give a little bit more predictable, predictability to the rest of the world as to what to expect uh, from this president's foreign policies. But the other is, um, you know, it's a dirty little secret that when we work on these documents like like the European Commission recently produced, or in my case, uh, working on the President's National Security Strategy in 2002, that also becomes self-enforcing. It becomes your touchstone. It actually creates a little discipline in the decision-making. If the President uh, is part of a process that lays out his strategies, he also begins to think through that strategic framework and, and perhaps takes some of the uh, uh, vacillations, fluctuations, even incoherence out of it. Um, it's, it's just one approach, but it's one that I think that uh, I do think this National Security Council is wor working very hard on. They've, they've appointed a Deputy National Security Advisor, a very talented woman, uh, Dina Powell, to do this. Um, a, another uh, well-regarded re well national security expert, Nadia Shadlow, is working with her to develop the national security strategy. You know, I, I, think, I think you've got some people in the White House who recognize this and are, are seeking to, uh, to address the obvious confusion that, uh, that exists. Peter, uh, let me just ask you yeah, one question. Yeah. I mean, this whole question of U-turns. Um, uh, you know, speakers have pointed out that what he said in the elections, he's done a U-turn. Now, some of these U-turns have been very productive and very good, actually. Mm -hmm. But then it leaves the question unanswered as to, uh, is this president consistent? Is he um, realistic, objective? Uh, can we rely upon him? Or can, will he do another U-turn and, uh, and dump NATO and dump everyone else as he did during his campaign? Well, to, in response to that question and what Steve has said, I mean, I don't expect sympathy, but I, we could have a little bit of empathy for the administration in the sense that they didn't expect they were going to win. <laughs> right? I mean, they may have believed it, but they, you know, the polls said, said differently. Good point. And they didn't have, they didn't have a, you know, I mean, they didn't have a team in place. Yeah. I mean, the Bush administration got held up in, in a court case, but they knew who all the main players were going to be. In terms of foreign policy, at least, I don't know about domestically, but in terms of foreign policy, I mean, they had the Colin Powells and they had the Rich Armitages and they had uh, the Paul Wolfowitzes and others. I mean, even though there was a, that delay in, in the uh, actual, in, because of the Supreme Court case regarding the election, they came into place pretty quickly. I mean, this, this, these folks uh, I didn't have, I don't think, enough time to really undertake a transition from where they were on November 7th. So I think things are a little, going a little bit slower than they had, um, you know, than they had hoped. So I, don't, I wouldn't ask for any sympathy, but empathy. I mean, I think you have to give them a little bit of time, especially in getting people into, especially in getting people into place and doing things like right. this. Uh, Sarah, would you like to say something? Yes, I would. Um, <laughs> I disagree. I don't think that they deserve any sympathy or any empathy, and I think that baseline competence is something you should expect from somebody who's going to be president of the United States, from the team of the people that are backing that president, and from the people that he hires. Instead, we've had multiple people removed because they happen to be foreign agents. We've had a level of incompetence that's so vast, it's left multiple positions unfilled. There is no excuse for this. I bet I could point randomly at any of you in this room, and you will do a better job leading the United States of America <laughs> than Donald Trump. I will give you five minutes to prepare, and you will still manage to outdo him. So no, I don't think that there's any uh, excuse for this. And as for the, the uh, question before that um, you know, was raised about the back and forth dialogue of you know, uh, what Trump says versus what he does, 
Um, I think we have a problem, uh, and the problem is Twitter. I think that this is something that uh, you know we should discuss because it's an example of how when you know he does something, the U.S. media and culture have one perspective, and the outside world has another. When he tweets, many people interpret what he's doing as a distraction that he's trying to get the press's back off him for various failures or various controversies, like for example the Russia the Russia interference investigation. The rest of the world is. Not not going to see that. And he is doing this with countries that react, you know, somewhat understandably, in a very uh, angry or agitated or confused way, uh, countries like North Korea. So I think that as a sort of starting point for that discussion, we need to establish, you know, there are two, pers three perspectives going on. There's the perspective um, of the press who, having no access to the White House and having, you know, very few press conferences, has to, you know, study his grammar, his punctuation, and every little tweet he puts out for whatever hidden meeting it's supposed to uh, you know, have. There's the perception of the foreign countries to whom he speaks. And then there's basically what I call the Trump, doctrine, the Trump doctrine, which is basically just the elevation of Donald Trump, which is one of his primary purposes in becoming the presidency, which again points to massive incompetence and a sign that he should not be there. Done. Stephen, you wanted to intervene. Yeah, just that, you know, so uh, to, to Sarah's point that any one of us uh, could step into the presidency and have some fully formed notion of what we want to do with our policies, but there is one prerequisite other than somebody pointing you out in the audience. It's getting elected by the people of the United States of America. President Trump is the duly elected and sworn president of the United States of America. And as far as all expectations should be, that's going to be the case for the next four years, and it may be for the next seven. Uh, because he has some political mojo that might well last through the next election and bring him in for a second term. All of us have to figure out what role we're going to play in, in the context of that. Our, our allies and friends around the world, um, us who are, uh, are uh, participants in the political debate. I don't expect everybody to be in lockstep. But we do, some of us are going to have to find a way to engage constructively with the President of the United States to lead the greatest country in the world. And, and I have to say, I can point to anybody who says they can do it, but I saw 17 people on the stage during the Republican primaries and 16 of them lost. The one I worked for was eminently qualified to step into the presidency the next day, and he lost. He couldn't, get, he couldn't muster a minority of votes in the Republican Party. Um, so you know, he's our president. James. Uh, there's this famous saying that you've probably all heard that we're not supposed to take the president seriously. Sorry, we're not supposed to take the president literally. We're supposed to take him seriously. Uh, I don't take him seriously or literally. And I think that's what we've learned over the past couple of months. Um, it pains me to say this, but I really do believe that he is, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with someone who's not mentally sound. And you laugh, but this is, this is true. Uh, he is a malignant, he's a malignant narcissist. Uh, every action seems to be dependent not upon the interests of the country, but upon his own insecurities, his own needs, his own desire for validation. Um, and this is deeply, deeply concerning. Um, we really have the fate of the world resting on the fact that this man's father didn't tell him he loved him when he was a boy. Um, and we should be very grateful that there are, we should be very grateful that there are uh, qualified people around him, like the defense secretary, like the national security advisor. Um, but that is really the only thing standing between us and the abyss. Um, two quick questions and then I'll, I'll open it. Um, you can answer either one. The first is, you know, what happens to American values in all this? Like the American exceptionalism, the shining um, um, house on the hill, and you know all, all, all the rhetoric that has preceded American presidents and American governments um, for, for at least 200 years. Um, and the second question, which I think is very relevant here, is you know we've seen this U-turn on Europe, we've seen a U-turn on NATO, from saying you know they're all useless to they're all very mm -hmm. good. Except on both counts, there seems to be only one talking point, which is that they have to pay up. Um, NATO, you know, has to, everybody has to give the 2% um, for, for uh, spend 2% on their defense budget. Um, and, and Europe, I mean, we, everything we do with Europe, you know, Europe has to pay its way. Um, are, we, are we going to see um, a, a more sensible um, alliance between 
um, the oldest allies really uh, th that we have since the Second World War between the US and Europe and NATO. I think on NATO, what's, you know, yes, he's come around and it's no longer obsolete. He doesn't understand why NATO is good in and of itself. I mean, I would argue, I would make the, the hypothetical argument that even if our NATO allies weren't paying anything on their defense, it would still be in the American interest to have NATO because you cannot put a price tag on peace and security on the European continent. We know what happens when there isn't peace and security on the European continent. He doesn't seem to understand this. He sees NATO purely as a piggy bank. If the piggy bank is full, then he seems to be satisfied. If it's not, there's gonna be problems, as he would say. I would also counsel against seeing his foreign policy, however, as you know, sui generis. I actually do think that Trump expresses a particular foreign policy tradition that has been present in the United States for almost 200 years. Uh, my colleague at Brookings, Tom Wright, wrote an excellent essay on this about a year and a half ago. It's a 19th century worldview. You could call it a kind of Jacksonian nationalism. It has always been present in the United States. It has never gotten this far. It's never taken the White House. You know, as Pat Buchanan expressed it earlier, William Howard Taft or whatnot. Um, so there is a genuine support for this kind of uh, worldview. Um, we've, just, we've just never seen it reach these heights. Stephen, would you like to say hmm. something? The um, question of American values? Yeah, America is the sum of more than just the president. And American values are the sum of more than the president's thinking. And while I don't profess to know the president's thinking on every issue, I, I uh, am an American. Um, I know the institutions. I uh, have served in several of them. Um, you know, America is still intact. America's values are still intact. And I think some of the more uh, extreme interpretations of the worst case in the Trump, uh, Trump presidency uh, are far from being provable. As far as NATO goes, you know, over the last um, many years, I've felt that NATO has been losing its vigor. It's in a steady decline. We've said the right things. We've done the summits on the right timetable. We've all shown up. Um, but it was kind of a play on that old Soviet cliche, you pretend to work, we pretend to pay, uh, we pretend to pay you. Uh, what is a more pro-alliance position? Insisting that all the allies meet their commitments to have a meaningful defense in a president who has a demonstrable willingness to exercise the Article Five responsibilities of the alliance or allowing it to drift and atrophy and potentially go out of business. Now, I, I, uh, if, if President Putin's strategy was to neuter NATO, um, I think he's in for a big disappointment. I think, we, uh, I think we may very well have reason to expect that NATO will be a more vigorous alliance over the course of the next few years um, than it has been in recent past. Peter. The thing that jumped to, to my mind, um, I realize this is a very European-centric, NATO-centric sort of conference, but uh, a lot of my pedigree is in Asia. Uh, and the United States has significant interests there as well and significant challenges that we forget about when we're talking about, we talk about NATO. And there, there are probably many people who are interested in Asia in this, in this room, but uh, the challenges the United States faces, I mean, the other day when the, our intelligence chiefs uh, testified in open session on, uh, to Congress, um, the number one threat they thought was North Korea. I mean, I don't know how many people in this audience are thinking about North Korea today or feel threatened by North Korea. But it really makes me nervous as somebody who's worked on the inside but currently on the outside when the intelligence chief tells me, tells me these sort of things because I kind of wonder what I don't know. And it's scary enough from the outside. Uh, what about the relationship with China? Uh, I think President Trump has, has done the right thing by pressing the Chinese uh, to do something about North Korea. I'm not so sure that's actually going to happen because I don't think American and Chinese interests align on the Korean Peninsula and I'd be happy to, happy to go into that. But um, there's the issues of the East China Sea. There's the issue of the South China Sea. Big issues. And as we talk about anybody who works on Asian issues, especially Americans, we always talk about the tyranny and distance, which we stole from an Australian. But if you fly, I mean, I, we flew, to, I flew to Germany from Washington in eight hours. You know what it's like to fly to Southeast Asia from the United States from the West Coast. Um, I mean, it's a, huge, it's a huge theater that needs a huge amount of resources especially as we're dealing with China's military buildup, whose intentions are quite unclear. 
So I would just ask people to you know, be thoughtful of the idea that the United States looks both towards Europe and towards Asia. And we have more trade with Asia today than we do uh, with, uh, with Europe. Um, and the rise of China is something that doesn't get the attention, especially in the military sphere, that perhaps it does, that Russia does here in, in Europe. Uh, but China is a, and it's my view, besides the United States, that no country will shape this century more for good or bad probably than China. Um, and this is something that the United States is, is having, to, having to deal with with its allies in the Pacific alongside of, alongside of the challenges of, of North Korea. So that was one of the things that kind of, I mean, I realize we're, we're in Europe here, but uh, that was something that kind of jumped out at me. Sarah, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about American values. Um, you know, as was mentioned, there is a gulf between the president uh, and the public. Uh, and I love my country, but I am horrified that this man, this autocrat, um, who is struggling against a democratic framework of checks and balances that may or may not hold, has become my president. Um, I want to point out that his victory uh, was both narrow and flawed. Only about 25% of the country voted for him. The election, as we know, was marred by Russian interference, which is one subject, but also just by baseline voter suppression and gerrymandering and flaws in our electoral system that go back to the founding of the United States. We have never been a perfect democracy. We have never been an equal country. But generally, at least through my lifetime, we've tried to progress towards that kind of change. And I live in the center of the United States. I live in St. Louis, Missouri. I live in a majority black city in a bright red state that voted for Donald Trump. And what I saw when he came into St. Louis and campaigned was that he was preying on people's pain and he was preying on people's prejudice. He was taking the economic devastation that is real, he's right about that, um, that has happened in the heart of America uh, and exploiting it for the most xenophobic and awful instincts that you can bring out in Americans. And he's hurting the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in our country. And as he stays in office, that's going to get worse. And I don't think that that's distinct from his foreign policy. I think that there's a linked quality in how he views other human beings, which is he views, he views them as disposable. He views them as people that don't deserve rights. They don't deserve dignity. They don't deserve of respect, and that kind of attitude will extend into other countries. It has already extended, for example, as Jamie brought up, how he treated um, Angela Merkel when she came for her visit. And so I think, you know, we need to be wary here. We are dealing with, you know, as was said, an eccentric character, somebody with obvious um, autocratic leanings, and somebody who's not rational, uh, who's destructive, and who has, you know, the, who may well break those American values. I'm proud of the American public for pushing back at him. I'm proud of my representatives and fellow citizens who are fighting to keep those values, to respect our Constitution, to keep our checks and balances. But I do not think that that is the aim of this president. Thank you. Well, I'm going to throw it open. Please, um, keep your questions short. And um, the lady in the front here. <laughs> it's the president. Sorry. <laughs> to ask the first question. Madam President. <laughs> Madam President, I beg your pardon. Can stick all you like president of this republic here. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. Thank you, Ahmed, for reminding that we need to stick to uh, foreign policy issues, and I gladly will. Yeah. Uh, it would be uh, really not nice from me to uh, deal with uh, any internal policy issues here. Hence, I don't. You know, when I've done with uh, synchronizing all our gossip about the new administration, then uh, we need to look at the facts of what's going on. I'm a very factual person and I deal much better with facts than uh, emotions. That's why I'm such a bad politician, sorry. <laughs> if I look for the U-turns in the new administration steps, I see, no, not a single U-turn. I see constant deepening of the understanding of transatlantic relationship, of values of NATO, of EU. I know that is very close contact at very high level between administration and the European External Action Service. I know President Trump has met Theresa May and Angela Merkel. There is no gender, but an agenda bias there because he's also met Gentioni and Mark Rutte. Lots of European leaders. Meetings with Juncker and Tusk are coming up. NATO meeting is coming up. Where is Vladimir Putin in the picture? Meet July half a year after taking office. 
if I now look at relations between new administration and Estonia, small country, any relations towards Estonia have to be by definition value-based or it is ignored. I haven't left Europe since my election in October. I've met close to 20 senators and congressmen on this continent. I've met Vice President Pence. I've met Paul Ryan. My colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs, has traveled to meet Secretary Tillerson. <coughs> Our Minister of Defense has met Secretary Mattis. You know, if I look at this picture, then it smells suspiciously of value-based foreign policy. I don't know what it is, but it looks considerably like value-based foreign policy to me. And my question now to all of you is actually, am I overlooking something? Should I expect a U-turn, which I'm not seeing coming? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I look for you, to you for the answer. In, um, in some ways, it, it, it's harder for Americans to discuss these issues because um, the whole campaign and the election in the United States did release a, a tremendous amount of emotion and, and anger and discontent, and the, and the country still remains very much unsettled. Um, in some ways, it's easier, I think, for some of our foreign partners to compartmentalize because they can look at the relationship in the context of their own interests. Um, you didn't pick our president, we did, the American people. Um, you look out for your nation's interests and you know, to the extent that you measure the success of this administration's policies, it, uh, you know, to, to a large extent it will be through that context. And so, uh, Madam President, your, your assessment is one that's not unique to Estonia. I met, uh, in, in, you know, uh, take it for what you will. I met with the Egyptian delegation and the Saudi delegation uh, the uh, same week that they were in Washington, D.C. to meet with the President of the United States, and they were giddy. Now, you may not like Saudi Arabia and you may not like Egypt, but these are two extremely important countries in the Middle East and two countries the United States has to figure out how to get right in order to bring uh, stability uh, uh, to the Middle East. The, uh, the Israelis, same thing. Now Israel looks at it through the context of its own interests, but it's, it's, no, um, it's no secret the last eight years have been one of near enmity and animus between the United States and Israel, one of America's most important allies in the Middle East. And so I could go on and on. The China, the China meeting that the President Trump had with Xi Jinping uh, set the foundation for uh, a personal dialogue that, as Peter said, and I agree, uh, sets the context for the most important relationship the United States has in the world. I'm not saying they're our best friend, but it's the most important relationship. And so there, it, the, it, the example and the experience of, of this country where we sit today is not significantly different than many others. Now, the presidents are going to make mistakes, and American foreign policy isn't going to be uh, you know, uh, on, a, on, a, on an arc towards constant success. And this president will have his failures, just like every other American president has had their failures, sometimes spectacular failures. But, you know, we're less than four months in, and if you look at the results, uh, which I do, I think, I think the test, uh, uh, the, uh, the measure of success can be credibly found there, not just for Estonia, but for many countries around the world. <clears throat> I think, do you want anybody else to comment on it? Or? Well, yeah, very briefly. Yeah, okay. Make, All right. well, I, can, brief. I can wait. I can, I can pass. No, I was going to say I agree, with, I agree with Steve. I can't tell you how many people of uh, foreign visitors have come through the Heritage Foundation saying the same thing, that they're off to the White House or off to the NSC, they're off to the State Department. I mean, America is engaged, uh, you know, around, around the world. And I think so far what we've seen, I mean, since we're in this part of the world, I'll use Neil Bohr's. I mean, prediction is hard, especially about the future. But... Um, you know, the fact is, is that I think so far the track record is something that, uh, that I'm quite comfortable in. In many ways, has shown more resolve than we saw in the previous administration on Syria with chemical weapons, on have, if, getting rid of the policy of strategic patience, which means we don't have a policy, basically, and moving with and North trying Korea. to, try, excuse me? With North Korea. With North Korea, so I'm speaking about North Korea in that terms, and uh, well, they've used it elsewhere, too. 
uh, is uh, you know shown some resolve in trying to resolve this very very difficult thorny and nettlesome issue uh, of nor and dangerous issue of North Korea. Right. Can um, I, can I say one thing? Yeah, can I say one thing? I think these positive developments that you're seeing are not happening because of President Trump. It's in spite of him. Um, I mean, let's not forget last summer during the Republican National Convention, he was asked by the New York Times whether or not the United States would come to the defense of its Baltic allies at NATO, and he specifically said it would be contingent upon whether or not they've paid their dues to NATO. And this was followed by perhaps the most reprehensible comment of the campaign, in my opinion, as someone who really likes Estonia and has been coming here a lot, was from Newt Gingrich, who said, well, we're not going to risk nuclear war over a suburb of St. Petersburg. That is how the president thinks. We're lucky, again, that he has not brought people like Newt Gingrich into his administration, that there are adults in the room. But again, these positive developments are not because of President Trump. It's in spite of him. And I'll just yeah. say one very quick thing to piggyback on him. Uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, you may find good and, and meaningful relations with others in the administration, and, and I hope that you do. Um, but Trump has been attacking our allies, uh, countries like Australia or Canada or Mexico, and praising those um, with whom we have hostile relations, like uh, North Korea, Russia, the Philippines, um, and Erdogan um, you know, becoming a dictator. So I would not trust him. I guess my advice would be you know, watch your back, uh, and I hope for the best. Well, uh, <clears throat> Madam President, thank you for your intervention. And I promise you I will remember uh, who you are <laughs> <laughs> next time. Um, yes, the gentleman here, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mike Hall, someone from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, one quick point, Peter. I think strategic uh, patience began under the Bush administration. It was not just the, uh, I mean, it has been a failure, but it's been a bipartisan failure. Um, full disclosure, Steve and Sarah and I were at a luncheon today where we talked about several of these things. and and. I would say that uh, Mr. Chairman's comment that you can't expect everybody around the world to uh, not to take seriously what the President of the United States says, and I would, I would use, and this I think is a colossal failure already, was his statement about banning Muslims from coming to the United States, thereby alienating more than a billion people. Now, he's walked it back, first to a, a list of seven countries and six, it is interesting that other Muslim countries are not on the list where he happens to have investments. I think that's a very serious problem. One final point, uh, the thing that really worries me is when a crisis comes, and there will be a crisis, there's always a crisis. And I think when the president doesn't have a knowledge base of his own, fixed ideas, or really understanding of transatlantic values, which I think are terribly important, um, then you fall back on character, character traits. And I regret, and I can't say how much I regret, that I agree with the characterizations of Sarah and Jamie. Uh, I think that it's terribly important for that reason that people of the caliber of Steve and Peter on the Republican side do try to put into place the kind of structures that will at least perhaps try to channel him in the right direction when that in inevitable crisis comes. Because if we leave it up to his instincts, I think we're in deep trouble. Right. Anybody like to comment on that? Right. Uh, here, gentleman here. Uh, bring, if you could bring the microphone here. Uh, it looks like our panelists do have little disagreements <laughs> on the topic. Um, and uh, looks like James is saying that the most important relation that the United States ought to have is Germany. And Stephen is saying that the most important relations that Mr. Trump has <laughs> is China. It's a little <laughs> difference between these two countries. And that is why, can I ask you just to rank three most important relations that Mr. Trump has in his mind, at least in the area of foreign policy? So I don't know the president's thinking. I've never met the president. I don't know him. Um, and my comment isn't, uh, and I, I wouldn't uh, deign to rank, uh, so I'm not going to do that. But what, let me explain what I mean by China is the most important relationship the United States has in the world today. If we get China wrong, 
there are consequences for the entire world. But if we get Germany wrong, it's bad. It's unfortunate. But Germany is a strong democracy driven by the shared values that we have in the Western Alliance. Germany will be okay. We'll be less for it, for sure, if we're not uh, in a close partnership and alliance with our German partners. Yes, we'll be worse for it. But the whole world will be worse for it if the United States and China uh, have a cataclysmic falling out. And I think that's why it, it, it ranks not as the best relationship, not as the most loving relationship, but it ranks as the most important relationship that the United States foreign policy has to get right for the safety and security of the entire world, not just our own. Right, there's somebody there, uh, exactly. You, sir. Um, <coughs> thank you. Yeah, with the hand. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, Ian Bond from the Center for European Reform. Uh, I wanted to pick up Peter's point, both about North Korea and about Asia more generally. Um, first of all, to point out that geographically, uh, Tallinn is closer to Pyongyang than Honolulu is. So uh, the geography, when you look at a Mercator projection, is sometimes a bit misleading. Um, but what I wanted to say was, um, I fully take the importance of Asia, but the first thing that the president did, and this is a big departure from past American policy, was to cancel TPP. Mm -hmm. And that, as I have been hearing from various Asian visitors to London in recent weeks, is a big blow to Asia and to the, the US's allies in Asia. Uh, now, he's also very hostile to, to TTIP. So, where is the US going on trade policy? Because that actually is also a crucial part of, of foreign relations and the alliances and partnerships that the US has around the world. But before you answer that, just pass the microphone to the person behind you and let him ask you. And the Western monopoly here, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a short observation to Sarah and then to questions. The, uh, talking about the autocracy, you know. Um, two months ago, I was taking a ride in a taxi with an Uzbek driver. And uh, he said to me, you know, I'm so glad I'm in Russia, such an amazingly free country. And uh, I All said, are relative. Uh, I said, well, you know, we kind of, well, I don't like Putin, I don't think we're free. Well, he said, well, you didn't live out in the Karimo. <laughs> so in a sense, I'm kind of slightly not spooked off by talk of Autocracy, because we were told all the time that American institutions, the Senate, the free press, the courts, all these institutions will stop any abuse of power that may happen in the United States, which happened in the United States. So my first question uh, is, uh, are these institutions dead? Well, judging by at least Sarah's intervention, they are. And we are talking about some kind of Nazi-style uh, uh, rule. And secondly, um, I just want to ask the participants to probably very shortly say, what do they think will be the trajectory, uh, the developments of America's relationship with Russia, uh, with, I hope probably not only Putin's Russia, uh, with Russia in the next four, well, uh, as Stephen said, seven years. So these are the two James. questions. Thank yeah, you. I just want to, this is, can I, can I oh, okay, sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up Uzbekistan. Um, that's what I did my PhD on, was you know studying Uzbekistan and its form of governance. And when Trump began to run, I actually wrote an article called Trump and Bashi because he seemed to be so in the vein of a Central Asian uh, dictator. But that said, there's obviously you know a great difference between Uzbekistan and the United States. Uh, I have friends from Uzbekistan. They don't get to go to conferences like this and talk about their government in the manner that I'm doing. So we are clearly really not at the level um, of Uzbekistan or even at a semi-authoritarian state. What we have is a government with autocratic authoritarian tendencies going up a against a democratic system, a system of checks and balances, and constantly, constantly having to you know, face those challenges, whether by the press or the judiciary. And what we are finding more and more is ex abuse from the executive branch against those systems that are supposed to check them. I think the firing of James Comey, who is investigating 
nominating the president is a prime example um, of this in practice. And that is very dangerous because when you get that kind of society, it can move fast. And if there is no one to check him, his autocratic tendencies will grow and we will become a more repressive uh, country. As for Russia, um, you know, we're in the middle of a giant interference uh, investigation that once again, uh, I do not know who will actually be leading this investigation. I don't know whether their findings will be accepted um, by the Department of Justice, given that Jeff Sessions is implicated in the inter interference scandal. So uh, we have a lot of problems. And I'll uh, let yeah, you take it, I think Jamie. The thing you need to understand about Donald Trump, he's not a fascist. He's a golfer. Um, and what I'm, and uh, all these bad things, that, all these bad developments that we're seeing, I don't, I don't, well, that's it. these bad developments that we're seeing, they're not, Trump does not have a grand ideological authoritarian project, okay? His attacks on the media, they don't, they don't derive, when he, when he calls the media the enemy of the people, it's, this doesn't derive from some, from some desire to quash the First Amendment and put journalists in prison. It comes from the fact that he's a narcissist who's insecure and doesn't like being criticized. Similarly, firing, uh, firing Comey, it's not because he wants to abolish the rule of law and checks and balances. It's literally because he said, the guy's a showboat. And there's only room for one showboat in Washington, D.C. So I just, I know, I, fine, but I just, I think we, it's unfair to fascists right. to make this comparison. <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> Right. No, can no, I mean, no, 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 I mean, no, no. Can I say no, no? I'm serious. I'm, ser I'm serious. Fascists are really good at getting things done. Okay. We have a hundred days in office, and it's been a complete and utter chaos and failure. So really, like, it's it's not an accurate comparison. Nobody's answered the first question. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, trade. Trade. <laughs> About what? About what? Ian, uh, will you be? Ian, will you we'll be to them. Uh, uh, Ian, will you be here tomorrow? Uh, t tomorrow, we actually have a full panel devoted to the issue of trade, and um, I disagree with you. President Trump has not been overtly hostile towards TTIP. He might have taken a couple of swipes here and there at the European Union, but in fact, uh, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, just came out this week endorsing uh, uh, taking up TTIP again. The problem with TTIP has never been in the United States of America, Ian, and I think we should all understand that. It's been in Europe. Yeah. The, as far as, as far as TPP, okay, well tomorrow uh, I'm on the panel, so you can throw your <laughs> tomatoes then. On TPP, um, let me just say TPP did not die on November 8th of 2016. TPP was not going to pass. TPP was not going to pass if Secretary Clinton were elected president, and it, it wasn't passed by this president. TPP died on the vine. It was never going to become a, a, a approved free trade agreement in the United States Congress because it was a geopolitical play instead of a trade agreement. Uh, but more on that tomorrow as well. On Russia, Constantine, if I could, if I could just uh, forecast a bit. Uh, first of all, uh, I, do wanna, I do wanna rise to the defense of Secretary Tillerson. I don't think it's fair in any way, shape, or form to describe him as a foreign agent for Russia. I think, that, I think that's un, unsubstantiated, and I think it's frankly slanderous. Uh, Secretary Tillerson is a seasoned international businessman who's operated around the world, including in Russia, where there happens to be a particular concentration of energy resources in his company It was in that business. Mm -hmm. um, but when I watched his confirmation hearing, I have to say I was deeply impressed that in his 40 plus years with ExxonMobil, this man has been paying attention to the countries he's been working in, and he knows them well. He gave a harder line on Russia than any elected official or appointed official over the last eight years, yep. bar none. Now, as far as, as far as what do I expect for U.S.-Russian relations, I expect a, a pragmatic approach. And I think that's, uh, that's very likely to require serious action on the part of the Russian government to uh, evacuate its forces from Ukraine and to fully commit itself to a peaceful uh, uh, settlement in Ukraine that restores Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, I think Syria is a, a different theater and slightly different kettle of fish. Um, but I don't think the U.S.-Russian relationship will turn on the question of Syria as much as it'll turn on the question of, of Ukraine. And I think ultimately uh, there will have to be some actions by the Russian government in order to elicit a reaction by the United States government for a warmer relationship. I I'm going to take a couple okay. of questions here. Um, first of all, the lady. It's very nice to have someone lady ask a question. And then the gentleman um, there who's just got his hand up. 
Thank you very much. My name is Tori Tausig from the Brookings Institution. I have a question for Steve and Peter about looking at uh, European security issues versus Asian Pacific security issues. And Steve, you mentioned that the US-China relationship is one that we have to get right, maybe more so than US and Germany. But I would argue when looking at the Asia Pacific, transatlantic unity is needed first for addressing challenges in Russia, in China. Um, and, and dealing with these problems multilaterally is what gives the US and our European partners leverage over other great powers such as Russia and China who don't have these alliances. So I'm kind of pushing back but also asking you a question on how should we look at these Asia issues or Russia and China but taking into account the transatlantic unity first and not as an either or uh, comparison. Thank well, I you. think just in the catalog of, of hi, hi, just, just, sorry, just pass the mic on so we get a couple and we, yeah. we'll ask also for the Chinese gentleman. Thanks very much. Uh, Chris Mering, German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, sorry to, to come back to the 2%, uh, but the equation is simply wrong. 2% doesn't get you more bang. And I can give you several examples on this. We have even countries in Europe who spend 3% on defense but do not contribute any meaningful capability to NATO. We have another country who has 2% in its uh, uh, constitution and builds out of the money at the national defense industry that is duplicating the efforts we are doing in Europe. So 2% doesn't work in terms of getting defense out of it. That was the statement. Um, on the question, uh, you're very much concentrated on describing the current situation. Um, what, what I see is we obviously we we agree to a certain extent what I take from from uh, Peter examples on the objectives, but we non but we may not agree on the means. Mm -hmm. So the question for me is looking forward, how should we deal with this administration? I mean, yes, the president may need a psychologist, uh, but at the end of the day, we now have to deal with an elected president and with his, uh, with his administration. How do we do with this? And what are the topics that we can immediately address as Europeans with this guy to have business with him in his terms? Thanks. Uh, if, if you could just bring the microphone forward and give it to the Chinese gentleman so we could just wrap up uh, uh, issue uh, with China. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, I'm Victor Gao. I'm the chairman of the China Energy Security Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm also a guest professor at the National Defense University in China. Uh, I have a very brief comment for all the uh, panelists just now. You mentioned that China-U.S. relations are considered as the most important bilateral relations in the world. Uh, this is actually very much acknowledged in China. If we talk about China and Russia, Chinese economy is about eight times bigger as Russia. So we believe that if we compare China, Russia, and the United States, for China and the United States to have friendly and constructive relations uh, is the most important thing for mankind in this century. And I think uh, President Trump has made the biggest U-turn in uh, recharacterizing China-US relations. And I believe this U-turn is a U-turn for the best and for the better. So I hope all the panelists will join me in trying to urge President Donald Trump and the US government to make sure that China-US relations will remain constructive and also will remain friendly going forward. Uh, this morning we also talked a lot about uh, European defense, for example. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, the point I want to make very briefly is that if we believe that China-US relations uh, have to remain constructive and friendly, then China-EU relations can also be friendly and uh, constructive. That will actually serve to lower the burden on the European countries in their defense considerations, either within the NATO framework or within the European defense framework. So I hope uh, we all will work together to urge President Donald Trump to no longer make a U-turn in his characterization of China-US relations. China-US relations have no other choice. They have to be constructive and they have to be friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's the three questions there, China and um the two percent for for NATO. Would any, anybody like to answer either of those questions? Or I'll, I'll answer Tori's question on uh, alliances. And thank you for uh, for for stating that. I fully agree. 
Um, America's relationships in Asia Pacific and in Europe both start with our allies. And we're much more effective if we can move outward from that. It's not an either or for the United States. You're not, uh, I don't think there's any sign that you're gonna find uh, President Trump's administration pivoting away from Europe to focus exclusively on China or even to pivot away from Europe and focus primarily on China. I think you've seen a, 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 a palpable and measurable commitment in the visit of senior officials and in the access to the White House for European embassies and diplomats and officials visiting Washington, D.C. Europe is important uh, to this administration, and I think they're demonstrating it in their actions. Asia Pacific is going to be uh, as important as well. There's a deep engagement, um, but, it's, it, but I do think it's possible to do both, uh, starting with our allies and moving outward. I, I agree with Steve, and I think that um, uh, Russia is, is, hasn't gotten enough talk this morning, um, or I guess we're in the afternoon now, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's morning at home. Um, it's, 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 it's critically important. I mean, the things that are, that are, going, that are going on here in, uh, in Europe, and, and Russia is driving it with its, uh, I think, its belligerent behavior. Um, INF treaty violations, the CFE, it's the SNAP exercises. I mean, I, I, Steve didn't mention the fact that there's a lot of information out there that the Russians are now supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan. And as we look at this policy again uh, in the coming days and weeks before the mini summit, I mean, I, I know people inside the government, if this is true, the reporting is true, then they have to be really bothered by that. The Russian-Iranian uh, relationship. Uh, there's uh, the cyber. I mean, w with domestic or otherwise, uh, it's it's a huge it's a huge issue. So I, I think the United States, you're right, does value uh, very much from its relationship uh, with its European friends and uh, and partners in in dealing with the challenges of Russia. Right now, um, capabilities. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Can we have a mic here in the front? No, but speak loudly. Yeah, I'm following. Thank you, Mark Fisher. I'm here for G Plus Europe. I actually want to come back to the question of Christian Mölling because that was also not really answered. Dealing with the White House, how do you deal with the White House? What would you tell European allies? Um, as the president has already said, she's um, um, met with uh, uh, the US government representatives at the highest level. So there is a, there is a presence, but um, from the discussion on the panel, what I saw from, from, from Steve and from Peter, basically um, putting a lot of priority on the very seasoned national security staff, the very um, experienced people that you have, like Master, Mattis, Kelly. Um, on the other side of the panel, basically, lots of criticism, some warranted, maybe some a, bit, a little bit too strong of the president himself and, of, and of, of his volatility of his means of communication. The question is really, in this slightly unusual environment, what would you advise allies how to deal with this administration and who to deal with? What levers to use? Is, is it basically going through the departments, going through Congress, going through the Senate? I mean, I, th I, I like the title of, the, of this um, discussion, but I think we focused maybe a little bit too much on the personality of the president himself, and not on how to deal with this from the position of allies. We are in Europe, after all, and we are in Estonia, so these are not academic questions. These are actually questions that have I think, quite important I think, I think you're already successfully doing it. I mean, very, very few people, question. very few people move, you know, go actually into the Oval Office and meet with the president. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, civilians uh, and military throughout the national security establishment in Estonia and the United States are dealing with each other. So I don't know that you, you would do anything different. Um, I think what you're doing now has been very effective in some of the things we've seen in Europe. You know, the, U, the U.S. brigade that's over here. It's uh, the F-35s, the F-35s here. Um, I think U.S.-Russian uh, relations right now are in a stasis, and I think they're very much in trouble. I'm not very optimistic on them at all, unfortunately, and most of that has to do with Russia's behavior. I don't know how the United States can overlook their behavior on some of the things that Steve and I and perhaps others, others have mentioned. So I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, I think what you're doing now is working based on what Madam President has already said. I, I think, there's, I think th there's two contexts for that. The first, uh, Mark, is mechanically how do you engage the White House? And I, th I think Peter's point is, is abundantly clear. The three foreign ministers of the three Baltic states were in the office of the National Security Advisor two weeks ago. That's the first time in five years that they've been in, received at that level in the White House. The mechanics are there. The engagement and willingness to, to meet are already there. The cabinet officials have been here. But there's a different context for that. Not how do you mechanically do it, but how do you 
psychically do it. And that's, that's much more challenging, but I go back to my points. Um, the, the, the measure of success is gonna be in their actions, not in their words. Words count, I completely agree with all those comments in there. Words matter, and the Muslim words especially matter, Mike, completely agree. So that, I'm not discounting the, 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 the words can be damaging, but focus on the actions, don't take the bait, and look for win-win solutions. That's yeah, I think dealing, yeah. dealing with, to the extent that you cannot deal with the president, that's a good thing. Dealing with the national security advisor or the defense secretary, that seems to me like a more productive way to forge your relationship. To the extent that you have to deal with the president, I think one, you need to really convince him because he is so transactional, why alliances are good in and of themselves and why they are force multipliers, why it's good for the United States to have allies. And the second tactic is flattery. Thank you. A question here in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Mark Mullen from uh, Transparency International. Um, my question is following up on, uh, on the discussion of American values. Um, you know, I, I feel like the, uh, the Republican Party's uh, posture towards, uh, towards Obama um, was really characterized by a, a, a very, very stubborn, stubborn or even belligerent attitude and, and seems um, remarkably more, uh, more uh, flexible now. And my, my question is, l let's say, um, with the research that's being done by, by, by journalists, by lawyers, by Transparency International itself, I mean, if it, it comes to pass that, that, uh, that President Trump is in fact um, a decades-long money launderer, um, largely through uh, sources um, from the, the, the Kremlin or, or Kremlin-sponsored oligarchs, if that is the case and he has lied and, and, and concealed that, uh, that information, what are the Republican Party's responsibilities in, uh, in that case? And how, how is the, I mean, obviously it's convenient to have two, uh, two legislative chambers and the executive, but what are their responsibilities in terms of, uh, of American values in that case? There's one more question here. Um, could we? I'm Mr. Kubinski from Slovenia. I would just like to remind that uh, I checked the statistics right now, and the biggest trading partner of the U.S. is still European Union, Absolutely. meaning uh, we are forgetting this. It's true mm -hmm. that the biggest deficit for the United States is China, mm -hmm. but not trading partner. The biggest trading partner by far is European Union. Thank you. Oh, we have more trade with Asia, that's what I said. Would, who, who would like to take on these two questions? Yeah. I'll, I'll take the first um, no. on... Uh, Obama and you know Republicans and just very briefly issue a plea uh, for the Republicans to put country above party, um, you know, for the good of this country, no matter what our disagreements are. Um, you know, we are Americans. I think that we would like the integrity of our executive branch to be assured, the integrity of our judiciary. And so I think we need a nonpartisan, independent investigation um, into Russia. And I think that's a very reasonable thing to ask. Um, it's not about, you know, condemning Trump. It's about finding out what happened because it affects our elections. Uh, it affected 2016 and it'll affect future ones um, if the problem is not resolved. Yeah. Given the way they've behaved so far, I don't anticipate congressional Republicans turning on Donald Trump unless he proposes to raise top marginal tax rates. That is the only, and I'm being serious, I don't see any other, I don't see any reason to think that they will turn on him. Uh, no, yeah. I'll take on the uh, other one. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, so, because I, I trust it's in the context of uh, perhaps a clumsy statement that I'm going to uh, regret later about China being the most important relationship. And let me say the same thing about the European Union that I would say about Germany. That if the United States gets the relationship wrong with the European Union, the European Union is still going to exist. It's still going to be uh, an, an exemplar of democratic values. It's still going to be successful economically. And the United States is not going to go to war with the European Union. Um, we can fail in our relationship with the European Union. We shouldn't. It would be to our own detriment. But I, I don't know if I'm digging in deeper or making more clear why I, why I assign a different importance to the relationship with China. Um, there's a lot of apocalyptic talk in US-China relations. Um, I'm sure many of you heard it. The, the, um, you know, the, the inevitability of conflict uh, with a rising power and a, and a shrinking power 
Um, you know, I, I don't, I just don't buy on to a dialectic view of history that certain outcomes are foregone conclusions. We have to work very hard to get the Chinese relationship right uh, because it's of consequence to the entire world. Um, we are about to wrap up. I want to give all, all four of you one minute exactly to give, a, give your prognosis for the future. Where does Trump go from here? Uh, where does U.S. policy, foreign policy go from here? In reverse order. Sorry? In reverse order. Okay, in reverse order. James? Uh, where does it go? Um, I think we're going to muddle through. Um, I don't see, well, what I'm really worried about is a crisis because I fundamentally believe that this man does not have the temperament to be president of the United States. Uh, and I really worry about how he will respond when push comes to shove. Um, but again, I do think that he is surrounded by experienced people who know what they're doing. I think the serious strike uh, was an example of this. Um, and I do think that if push came to shove with, some, with the Russians attempting something in Europe, I do think he would take the counsel of his defense secretary and his national security advisor, and he would respond appropriately. So there is some hope. Um, but ultimately, I am very worried just because of the man's temperament. Um, I don't know where he'll go. Uh, he may go to jail. He may stay in power for a long time. I think it's more important to look at the big picture of our electoral system. Uh, a lot of people talk about 2018. I'm not assured that our 2018 elections are going to be free and fair based on initiatives that are being formed now uh, that will consolidate power, um, that will enact voter suppression, um, as well as the ongoing Russian interference uh, investigation, which may be shut down forcibly by the executive branch or may come to another conclusion. Uh, so it's very, uh, you know, it's very difficult to ascertain where Trump exactly will be. So I think that we should be looking at the strength of our institutions. We should be keeping that in mind and trying to make them stronger um, as this <coughs> crisis plays out. And I, I agree with Jamie that it is indeed a crisis. Yeah. Um, the president uh, inherited quite a difficult uh, international landscape. Uh, we've talked about a lot of those things today. Um, and I think that the his foreign policy will continue to mainstream itself, and uh, I think it'll continue to look to strengthen relationships with uh, friends and, and challenge foes. The President of the United States was duly elected by the people of the United States under our constitutional rules, and there has been no credible evidence presented to suggest that he was not legitimately elected. Certainly, there are many uh, concerns about the degree to which the Russian government intervened uh, in, the, uh, in the news environment and in the, uh, and in the uh, private emails of people involved in this campaign. Those are very serious allegations. Um, I'm inclined to believe them, and I think that they deserve a thorough investigation, and quite honestly, they deserve a meaningful U.S. response as well. But President Trump is the president, and I'm sorry he wasn't elected because of the Russian intervention. He was elected because the American people chose him. Have some faith in us. Um, we still are the United States of America. Our institutions are still the same. In fact, you've seen those institutions performing in some ways admirably uh, over the course of the last few months. And so, patience, watch the results, not the words, and hopefully in time, um, we find a place where uh, the conversation is a little less heated and a little emotional, um, but it's probably too much to expect that to be the case so soon after one of the most turbulent elections in, in our modern history. Thank you um, very, very much. I just want to say one thing um, before we give a round of applause to our four uh, participants. Um, I, I've been asked to ask you all, please stay in your positions, keep sitting, because we have a speech by the uh, President of Finland following on r right after this. And uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for coming.